Good morning, Sukihotu, and a very warm welcome, dear brothers and sisters in the Dharma. Welcome to our very first physical talk after a three years absence at our this Dharma hall today to listen and contemplate on the Dharma. Okay, today's talk will be very special in many ways. Firstly, our speaker for today is a very renowned speaker who is for the first time giving a talk in our center here and which I'll later give you the profile and the synopsis of the talk. Secondly, our talk today is broadcast live on YouTube and Facebook. And this uh, talk today is also cross-broadcast by nine other Buddhist societies and associations. And there'll be a lot of live audiences here. So when the camera pans onto you, you'll be also be shown live on YouTube, okay? Now, uh, I'd like to give a shout out and welcome to all our online listeners and also to the and a shout out to the nine Buddhist societies who are joining us live today. They are Johor Gladiance Metta Buddhist Fellowship, Mudita Buddhist Society, Kwantan Buddhist Association, Kota Baru Metta Rama, Putra Heights Buddhist Society, Persatuan Buddhist Hilir Para, Clang and Coast Buddhist Association, Taiping Insight Meditation Society, and last but not least, Buddhist Gem Fellowship. Okay, let us start our puja now by um, <coughs> paying respect and homage to the Triple Gems, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Let us all kneel. I bow before the compassionate Buddha, the supremely enlightened one who shows the way to liberation. I bow before the glorious Dharma, the Buddha's teaching that leads from darkness to spiritual light. I bow before the Holy Sangha, the fellowship of Buddha's disciples who inspires and guides. Let us now do the offerings. Let us all stand uh, to the middle while the ushers are bringing the offerings. As they bring in the offerings, you just touch the offerings and you can say sadhu three times. Let us settle down our minds and reflect on the offerings we make to the Triple Gems to remind us of what they each represent. Padipa Puja, Offering of Light. With light shining brightly, abolishing this gloom, I adore the enlightened one who dispels the darkness of ignorance. Pupa Puja, Offering of Flowers. I worship the Buddha with these flowers. May this virtue be helpful in my emancipation. Just as these flowers fade, our body too will undergo decay. Palapuja, offering of fruits. We offer these fruits to remind us to practice with healfulness until we taste the fruit of liberation. Paniya Puja, water. This water, pure and clean, reflects our original state of mind Mindful of its pureness, we strive on. 
Dupa Puja, offering of incense. The fragrance of this incense invites the awakened mind to be truly present with us now. The fragrance of this incense fills our practice center, protects and guards our mind from all wrong thinking. Okay, let's uh, con back to our place and we continue with the puja. Homage to the Buddha, Namakara. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Three refuges, ti sarana Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammam saranang gachami Sangham saranang gachami Dutiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami Dutiyam pi dhammam saranang gachami Dutiyam pi sangham saranang gachami Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi damam saranang gachami Tatiyam pi sangkam saranang gachami Five precepts, Pancasila <coughs> Panati patta veramani sika padang samadhyami Adinadana veramani sikha padang samadhyami Kamesu michachara veramani sikha padang samadhyami Musawada veramani sikha padang samadhyami Sura meraya majapama datana Veramani sikha padang samadhyami Imani pancha sikha padami samadhyami Imani pancha sikha padami samadhyami Imani pancha sikha padami samadhyami Five ennobling virtues <coughs> With deeds of loving kindness, I purify my body with open-handed generosity, I purify my body. With stillness, simplicity, and contentment, I purify my body. With truthful communication, I purify my speech. With mindfulness, clear and radiant, I purify my mind. Salutation to the Buddha, Buddha Vandana. Iti piso bhagava arahang samma sambuddho Bija charana sampano sugato lokavidu 
Anutaro purisat dhamma sarati satta deva manusanam buddho bhagavati Salutation to the Dhamma, Dhamma Vandana. Sawakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko Opanyaiko Pajatang Vedita Bhurvinuhiti Salutation to the Sangha, Sangha Vandana. Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Uju Pati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Nyaya Pati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Samichi Pati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Yadidam chattare purisa yugani Atta purisa pugala Esa bhagavato savaka sangho Ahunayo pahunayo dakineyo Anjali karaniyo Anutaram punya ketha lom kasati Blessings <coughs> Homage to the enlightened Buddha Perfect in wisdom and compassion Homage to the noble Dharma The universal law the Buddha taught Homage to the holy Sangha The protectors of the noble Dharma to these three jewels I go for refuge. May the three jewels bless and protect me and my loved ones. May we be free from harm and danger. May we overcome our difficulties. May we always meet with success. May we be blessed with good health, strength, peace and happiness. May my parents, brothers and sisters, teachers, Relatives and friends, be well and happy. May they be free from harm and danger. If they are faced with danger, may they overcome their anxieties quickly. If they are faced with ill health, may they regain good health soon. May the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha bless and protect them always. Aspirations? May the Buddha guide my thoughts and actions throughout the day. May the Dhamma help me to be strong in moments of weakness. May the Sangha inspire me to act with kindness, patience and forgiveness in my dealings with others, including those who are unfriendly to me. May the Devas protect me and my family. May the Arahants, Bodhisattvas and Buddhas guide me in my daily life. May this country be blessed with peace and prosperity. May I have the opportunity today to help someone in need of my love and support. I shall not waste this life in useless pursuits, but use it well to bring benefit and happiness to the world. May the Buddha be at my head, the Buddha in my heart, and the Sangha by my side to protect and guide me always. May all living beings, including those who are unfriendly to me, find peace and happiness. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, good morning and welcome back. Once again, uh, welcome to all uh, listeners who are here physically and also online. Uh, today, we have a very interesting talk by a very renowned speaker who is for the first time coming over here to Shalom Buddhist Society. Let me give you a brief synopsis of this talk today. 
Today's talk is The Two Paths by Dr. Punel Wong. And uh, a brief synopsis. Are you aware that there are two paths within the Four Noble Truths? The Buddha taught about gratification, drawback, and escape of sensual pleasures. What do we understand from this? And how do we let go when it appears to be so enjoyable? So let us hear from our speaker today. Uh, a brief, um, uh, in the brief background of our speaker, Dr. Punya Wong. Dr. Punya Wong is now a retired medical doctor who saw much dukkha in three plus decades of work and seeing how ignorance led to much dukkha. He shares the Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, and Jakarta, and was invited as a speaker in Global Conference on Buddhism. The last two plus decades is now dedicated to Dharma sharing and letting go. Without much ado, I would like to now invite Dr. Puna Wong to share with us his talk for today. Over to you, Dr. Puna. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Namo Buddhaya and good morning everyone. Thank you, Sister Eileen, who is not here because she's not well, for inviting me to come and share in Shah Alam. This is the second time I've been to this center, but the first time that I'm sharing in this center. And very glad to meet all of you. Some of you I've known virtually like Kaleong for the last two or three years and of particular happiness to me this morning is the fact that my tutti, Dr. Hani Chua, has traveled all the way to come and meet me and to me that's very important when you meet someone who was your student from many years ago. If I were to ask what is the very first teaching the Buddha gave? I know very few names in here, so don't worry, I won't ask by the name. <laughs> but I know Kareem, so I say Kareem. If I were to ask you, what is the very first teaching the Buddha gave after he became enlightened? And many of you would have attended Dhamma class downstairs with all the children, my wife teaching Dhamma classes in the local center for the children for many years. And you will answer, oh, the very first teaching the Buddha gave is the Dhamma Chakapawatana, the first discourse. But is that the first teaching the Buddha gave? Actually, that's not the first teaching the Buddha gave. The first teaching the Buddha gave is not in words. The first teaching the Buddha gave was by his actions. After the Buddha become awakened, what did he do? He was very, very grateful to the Bodhi tree that sheltered him for the one duration in which he spent trying to attain the purification of his mind. That's the very first teaching the Buddha gave, not by words, but by his personal action. And you know, he stood in gratitude to the Buddhi tree, which is not even a sentient being. So that's the very first lesson for all of us to constantly remember. And I'm very grateful that you have invited me here to share because he has given me an opportunity to do something good. And I've always shared that in all the many years I've been sharing the Dhamma, I actually learn more than those whom I teach because in teaching, I actually learn. So, I think that's the very first thing every one of us need to be doing as a Buddhist. We must be grateful. The very fact that we are meeting here for the first time after two whole years of COVID is that we are alive. I am quite sure 
everyone in this room will have a friend or a relative or a colleague who has died from COVID. In the early days, it was horrible. People were dropping dead literally everywhere. Now, after two years, we seem to have forgotten that already. We seem to take it for granted. But people have died. I have a close friend who died from COVID. So I think that the first thing is we should be grateful we are even able to come and sit together here and listen to the Dhamma. And remember, that's the very first thing the Buddha taught. Katanu, gratitude. Now, the sharing today is with regards to the two paths. The Buddha Dharma or the teachings of the Buddha is very unique in that sense that you have absolute freedom to choose what you wish to do. You have that freedom. You only need to be aware of the consequences and be prepared for whatever consequence that choice you have made will give rise to. Technically speaking, in the Buddha Dharma, there is no right and wrong. There are only choices and consequences. That's why if you look at dependent origination, there's no right, there's no wrong. From ignorance, you have Sankara. Sankara now translated by Sujato as choices. In the older editions as volitions, that means decisions that you and I make. That's it. It's not right, it's not wrong. But from whatever state of mind we are in, we make decisions. And that decisions will have consequences because all causes will give rise to effects. So in the Buddha Dharma, there is no such thing as you don't believe in me, you go to hell. You believe in me, you go to heaven. There is no such thing. That's blatant marketing by people. The Buddha said, you must know what is cause, condition and effect. And whatever decisions you have decided to make in your life will give rise to effects when the conditions are appropriate. I'm very grateful that Brother Sunanda, Shisan, etc. took me out for dinner last night. We had a lovely dinner and we shared for a long time. As I always say, there is no such thing as a free meal. The brothers invited me for tea in Sramban on my, Ewa, on my way up and they interrogated me for one hour. <laughs> so last night we had dinner and we was interrogated for two hours. And so I was sharing with Sister Karim. I say it's basically just choices. So if one of us here decide to remain single and not married, is that right? Is that wrong? She there's no right, there's no wrong. Culturally, 30, 40 years ago, if let's say we say, I choose to remain single, our parents, our grandparents will probably faint. Okay? But if my children now tell me that they choose to remain single, both of them are married, but if let's say they had told me that they choose to remain single, I would say, go ahead if that's what you want. Because to me, that's their choice. They only need to realize that all choices have causes and effects. And that's why when my children were young and I was trying to teach them Buddhism, my wife, who has a much better EQ than I have, used to say as long as they know causes and effects, as long as, as, long as they know that there's a consequence to their action, that's good enough. If you start teaching them, avijabhachayo sankara, they'll become Christians overnight. <laughs> so what we mean is, if Karin decides to remain single, I say it's perfectly all right. You will have single happiness, you will have single suffering. If you choose to become married, you will have marriage happiness. You will also have marriage suffering. If you choose to have children, then you have children happiness and children suffering, etc. Samsara never fails to disappoint. He will always give you dukkha. It's just in what form is that dukkha. So this is something we are familiar with. This is the first discourse, the Dhammachaka Pavatana, part of it, as recorded in the Samyutta, which is in front of me. 
And this is the very foundation of the Buddha's teachings. And there are a few key things here that I wish that we all understand. Because like any form of education, if your foundation is weak, then the rest is going to be a very shaky building. So this is from the Dhammachaka Pavatana, the first discourse to the five ascetics. And the Buddha said, now this is the noble truth of suffering. This is common translation, Dukkha Satcha. Now, there's a very important thing here that I hope every one of us here realize. The Buddha did not use the word suffering. Hundred years ago, when the great Professor Rice Davies, when the great Mrs. I. B. Homer, great academics started translating, they translated to their understanding and they used the word suffering. After that, we are stuck because it is now in common consciousness and to change it is almost impossible. So we are stuck. But the word dukkha, as in dukkha satcha, the first noble truth, actually does not mean suffering. Suffering is only one tiny aspect of dukkha. Dukkha more accurately will be reflected by words like dissatisfaction, unsatisfactoriness. Young people will say emo, unhappy, stress, and of course finally, mental suffering. The late Bante Suvano, who many of you I'm sure know, passed away a few years ago. He translated this word as mm song. Of course, he used Hokkien and Bo song. But he used the word mm song. Here we are all Cantonese speaking, so we'll use Cantonese. To online speakers from Kelantan, I'm sorry, I don't know what dialect you're using, but <laughs> in Hokkien and Bo song, in Cantonese, mm song. And I thought that that's actually a reasonably good description of the word Dukkha. Because inside you, there is something which does not feel right. It is like if Sister Kamata draws up a sales and purchase agreement, and after that she sends it off. But deep inside her, she sends there's something mm, not right with that agreement. There's something mm, song there. That is Dukkha. And that is what the Buddha said, that is the common denominator of our life in samsara. No matter what you do, there is something which will irritate you, trouble you, stress you, cause you distress. Mm, song. So what's the opposite? The opposite, the 180 degree direction. No, if you are awakened, then what will mm, song become when you become awakened? What is the word in Chinese, since we are using mm song, which is Cantonese? The opposite direction in Chinese is zi zai, ji joy, liberated. So Sister Kamata feels, ah, hou song ah. From mm song now become hou song because all oh, ji joy already, all let go. Poor Sister Karin doesn't have documents this thick to wet before she sent it to her client. I know. My oldest daughter is a lawyer. I see her endlessly reading, 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 reading. Huge documents. She prepares lots of contracts. And at the back of your mind, she always tell me, she phone her mummy and tell the mummy, did I miss something? It's an international contract worldwide. I mean, sometimes even we do our best also, we still miss something. So she keeps on saying, did I miss something? Did I miss something? So I can see at the background, there's always a level of stress. She is not Ji Joy. Whether Sik Fan or whatever, at the background, always thinking, did I miss something? So the opposite of it in Chinese is Zi Zai. When in Chinese we say Zi Zai, that means you are awakened already, you know. You have become an Arahant. So coming back to the first noble truth, Dukkha Satcha, and now we understand this word. That's why you see in my writings, I don't use this word, I use back Dukkha. Here I'm using it to illustrate. So what is Dukkha? The Buddha said. He said, birth is Dukkha. Aging, sickness and death is Dukkha. 
association with those you don't like is to come. Dissociation with those that you like is to come. Not getting what you want is to come. And finally, he summarized it in one line. Your aggregates, your form, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. And I believe when I say that in this hall, most people know what I'm talking about. That's called the Nama Rupa. And we are very lucky in Malaysia. We are so blessed in Malaysia because we know Malay. Malay borrowed lots of words from Pali. Nama Rupa is exactly as it is in Malay. Rupa, our physical form. Nama, the labeling we gave, and hence, Hanni Chua. Kamata, Karin. Literally labeling. We have given Kamata an identity. We have given Dr. Hanni Chua an identity. We have given Karin an identity. And because I have given Karin an identity, Karin is separate from me. I am me. You are Kareem. Get it? So as long as you grasp to this identity of Nama Rupa, Rupa being the form, and the Nama, the four components in the mind of how we create an identity, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness, you have created what the Buddha called a duality. You and me. We are separate. So the Buddha said, as long as you grasp onto this me, I, mine, you are going to suffer. And at the point when you die, as long as any aspect of the five khandhas, the Wu Yin, the Nama Rupa, is grasped, you have created the condition for rebirth. Because you will come back. Because you want to come back. All right. Now, in Majima Nikaya, there's a sutta addressed to the dying Ananta Pindika. In the Samyutta Nikaya, there are suttas addressed to the sick Ananta Pindika. But in some Majima Nikaya, there's one sutta called Ananta Pindika, Ananta Pindiko Sutta in which he was addressed to the dying Ananda Pindika. He was literally dying. I say here. Did the Buddha go there or send the monks there to chant Bojanga Sutta? No. That is something we created. If you look in the Nikayas, all the lay people and monks who are sick, who are dying, the Buddha will either go or send Sariputta or Ananda and give a Dharma talk, just like we are talking now. It is only to the fully awakened Arahans, who are either sick or dying, that they will talk of the Bojanga Sutta. Because the fully awakened Arahans, of which in the canon you will see Mahakashapa in one of them, when he was sick, they were taught, they were reminded of the Bojanga, the seven awakening factors. And that's because they know what these seven factors are about. If anyone in the street now is dying, and I send Brother Leong to chant the Bojanga Sutta in Pali, the blow will see them killing up mud. <laughs> in the suttas, you will always see that the person understands what was being told. It's never in a language. In fact, in the Vinaya, the Buddha made it very clear, you must use the local language so that the people can understand. But today, we have made it like magic, you know. You know, in, 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 in the Mahayana or Northern tradition, the Sing Ting is such a wonderful teaching. This whole book, hundreds of suttas, is summarized in 260 words of the Sing Ting. This whole book is summarized in just 260 words. So within the 260 words, is very, very profound core Dhamma. But what have we done? We have treated the same thing like it's magic, you know. You sick, I chant the same thing for you, and you listen to the words, you're okay. But that is not what it is meant. We are supposed to understand the words. All right, so I hope that's another myth that I hope to 
break. Hope I don't get thrown out of Shah Alam Police Center, but the truth has to be said. So, the next one, and I put a star here. This is important. Now, this is the next one, the cause of Dukkha, Samudaya. This is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. And we are all familiar with this, I'm sure. Craving. But what we are familiar with is these three lines. Craving for sensual pleasure, craving to continue existence, craving to end existence. This is taken directly from here, word for word, except for certain words which I changed to illustrate. Please note, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, no doubt, is this emotion called craving. Craving is an emotion. Okay? It's an emotion. So now let's say um, the latest iPhone came out. I don't know what number. La. I, I don't use iPhone. Like iPhone 14 or something or 15. 14. Okay. Probably will cost one kidney, but people want it. So people will buy it. Many of you would probably have bought it. But is your iPhone 14 that you queue one day up for to buy any better than your iPhone 13? Probably not. Almost all the functions in your iPhone 14 that you use are probably also found in iPhone 13. And what little extra you probably don't use. I probably use half of the functions of my Huawei. Huaren Huawei, that's why I stick to Huawei. Huaren Huawei. What I'm trying to illustrate is this. When you feel happy buying the iPhone 14 or whatever, we're just using it as an example to illustrate. Why are you happy? Is it because of the phone? Actually, any phone also will serve the same purpose. Because we use very fundamental things in the phone. Call, SMS, text, WhatsApp, maybe a video call to the children. But what makes you happy is the satisfaction of the craving. Your craving for that is satisfied for the moment. And you feel happy. But that craving will be replaced by another craving very, very soon. Well, let's put a crude example. Somebody already married, nice family, beautiful wife, beautiful children. You will never imagine why that man have an affair. And I tell you it's very common. Huh? <laughs> you will never imagine why. You think, why did the fella do it? Why? Nice family, everything is okay. So why did he have an affair? Actually, it's very simple if you understand the Buddha Dharma. He had a craving for sensual pleasures. He had to satisfy that craving. It's not a girl, you know. After he had an affair with a girl, he'll dish him and then the next one will come. It is the continuous craving that needs. It is the satisfaction of the craving. So the Buddha said, very wisely, that if you're going to have all these cravings, sensual pleasures, you're going to create dukkha. You can imagine the instant a man has an affair, every time he goes home, at the background there's always this background noise. Chinese say, don't know at what time the thing will suddenly erupt out. So that's the first one. And that's easy for you to understand. Now what I want you to understand is this in red. It's the craving that leads to future rebirth, the Buddha said. Mixed up with relishing and greed, taking pleasure in the various different realms. Now this is a fundamental difference between the Buddha Dharma and all the Tahistic religions. Almost all the Tahistic religions that I am aware of, I may be wrong, please correct me, they want to go to heaven. Not in the Buddha Dharma. This is with reference to rebirth in the heavenly realm. In the Buddha Dharma, that is not 
the ultimate goal. Because the Buddha Dharma tells you that heaven is also a temporary state. I always like one particular clip I saw on TikTok. This man was saying, I want to go to heaven. Okay? Maybe Brother Yo, I want to go to heaven. Then the speaker asked back, Brother Yo, Brother Yo, do you know or do you not know or can you possibly not imagine that you are already in heaven and you're making it hell? Right now you are already in heaven and you are making it hell. You are already in heaven and you want to go to somewhere else. We have made our heaven hell. In many situations, heaven is a state of mind. There are a few suttas even in the Nikayas which describe hell as a state of mind. Of course, there are other suttas which describe it as a physical place. So in the Buddha Dharma, heaven is not the goal. The goal is Nibbana, and Nibbana is not heaven, it's completely different. So, please note this star, because that is important. Because there's one particular sutta in which the Buddha directly criticized people 2,600 years ago, who went around promoting that if you follow me, after you die, you have eternal life in heaven. And the Buddha directly criticized that as a lie. There is no such thing as eternal life in heaven. Okay? Then, of course, the fourth truth, sorry, the third truth, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Please note that this line, eh? you will find something striking in there. The word Nibbana is not mentioned there. So, while we so often associate the third noble truth with Nibbana, if you look, the word is not there. Okay. What is in there is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering or dukkha. It's the fading away and cessation of this very same craving with nothing left over. Giving it away, letting it go, releasing it and not adhering it. It is the letting go of this. It doesn't talk of a place or a time, or a future. If you are able to let go of this now, you are Nibbana. The state of mind of Nibbana. So Nibbana is not a place. Okay, it's not Johor Bahru or Sungai Pelik or something like that. It's not a place. It is you getting rid of that craving. Now, of course, how do you get rid of that craving? You cannot just say, okay, I will get rid of the craving. You can't. To get rid of the craving means you must have right view. Right view is the very foundation of this path. That means at least your theoretical understanding, which is what we are here for. And from right view, you will get right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness. And here I use the word right stillness. I did not use the word right concentration. From Rice Davis and I.B. Homer days, they used the word right concentration. Sujato used the word right immersion, which I think makes it even more difficult to understand. I prefer right stillness, which is what Ajahn Brahm prefers. So if you have the right view, naturally your thoughts are correct. Your thoughts are correct, your speech, action, and livelihood are correct. And now the next thing is to train the right effort, the right mindfulness to create the right calmness of mind. Why do I use the word right stillness? Now, you know that the four main Nikayas, Dika, Majima, Samyutta, and Anguttara, the thickness is Samyutta, next is Anguttara, and then Majima, then Dika. These are the four main Nikayas. If you are to study one Nikaya, if Sister Karin is to tell me, oh, yo, I only got time to study one, then I will say study Samyutta. This. Why? Because Samyutta Nikaya contains the core teachings of the Buddha. All the core teachings of the Buddha is recorded in the Samyutta. 
if you're a lay person who enjoy lay life and said, I don't want this, then read Anguttara. Because Anguttara has lots of suttas for lay people. How to make money, how to spend money, etc. Okay. The Samyutta Nikaya has an equivalent in the Agamas. The Agamas is the Chinese version of the Nikayas. And the Samyutta Nikaya, which is this, has an almost identical Samyutta Agama in Chinese. So that tells us very, very important things. It tells us that the Samyutta Nikaya or Agama is very old. It predates the splitting into the two main lineages. That's why it is found in almost the exact same words and arrangement in both the traditions. So the first thing is, what is in here is very old. Second, of course, I told you the Heart Sutra, edited by Xuan Chang, summarizes this whole thick book in 260 words. Now, what is right? Sorry, what is Sama Samadhi? So commonly translated as right concentration in Chinese, in the Agamas. Sister Tamata, you know? No, she doesn't know. It's all right. It is not right concentration. Sama Samadhi is translated as Zhen Ting. Ting. The water is still. So Ajahn Brahm translates it as right stillness. That means your mind is still. It does not mean that Kamata sits in meditation, there are no thoughts. If she doesn't want thoughts, very easy. Like I just give her one sleeping tablet, no thoughts. But she's not going to be awakened. She's going to be a stone. The point in the training is for Sister Kamata to have thoughts, to have emotions which arise. But her mind is so well trained that it is still. She sees thoughts rising. She sees sights. She hears sound, in the hearing, just the hearing, in the thinking, just the thinking. Remember that line? There is no papancha, there is no proliferation. Her mind is thing. One of the very last lines of the Diamond Sutra says, Ruruputong, no matter what happens, her mind is still. Why is that important? It's because Rice Davies, I.B. Homer, great people, full respect for them. But they were not Buddhists, they were academics who translated according to their understanding based on Western philosophy. The monks who translated it into the Agamas were practicing monks. They translate from practice. Just as Xuan Chang edited the Heart Sutra, from his practice, not from theory. So, what is Samasati? We translate Samasati as right mindfulness. Right? What is it in Chinese? Kamata? Okay, Kamata will now say, I don't know Chinese, so don't ask me. What is it in Chinese? Anyone? Anyone? Just to make sure you're not asleep la, after I talk, 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 off and cow, you know, and I hear some snoring sound on the back. In Chinese, it's Chen Nian. How do you write the word Nian, honey? What's on top? Jing. What's at the bottom? Sing. Sing in the sutta is not tup, 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 huh? Sing is mine. Huh? Sing Jing is not tup, 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 huh? Sing Jing is mine. Huh? Okay? Nian is what is your present mind. Zhen Nian. Now, if you read this, you will see that right mindfulness or samasati has two components. And I'm sure all of you who attend sutta class and all that will know. There are two components. Sati Sampajana. You always hear these words. You must have sati and you must have sampajana. Modern translation, 
Sati, as I said, we are stuck with mindfulness. Sampajana, Sujato translates as situational awareness. Wow, long, long word. What is Sati Sampajana in Chinese? Zhenian is Sati. Sampajana is Zhen zi, zi dao de zi. That means not only are you focusing your mind now on what is happening, you must be aware. So if you need to, every beat you must be aware. Zhen zi. And you must have Zhen nian on what is happening. When you have Zhen nian and Zhen zi, it will lead you to Zhen ding. That's why you see this sequence. And this sequence is very important. Right effort is, you know, huh? just you might as well keep on doing, promoting the good, staying away from the not wholesome, etc. You must have the right livelihood. I mean, you are a gangster going around collecting Sao Sai Yong. How are you going to develop this? It's not possible. Huh? Because the Buddha say that to develop this, your five hindrances must slowly, slowly come down. Okay, if you are a 24-hour Mahjong Kaki, how are you going to develop something? Right? So that's why you have this sequence. So I hope that in driving up 300 kilometers, just showing this one slide, I have helped you understand a little bit more because the Buddha Dharma is very profound. I mean, most of us, la 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 Okay, next page. All right. Just this one. This is taken directly from here. Cut and paste. I changed the word to stillness, of course, to illustrate my point. Sujato put it as right immersion. All right, Karim. Now you I hope you appreciate how profound and how smart those people downstairs are. They're very, very smart, you know. Just that you and I don't study classical Chinese, so we don't understand, right, honey? Next. So I put the summary here. Craving that leads to future rebirth mixed up with relishing and greed, taking pleasure in the different realms, and that is craving for sensual pleasure, continue existence, and craving to end existence. This is very important. Because these are the three things. Craving for sensual pleasure, all of you understand. Craving for continued existence, I just explained. And what about this? Craving to end existence, the third craving. This is very profound. I hope none of you are in a hurry. <laughs> My wife tell me I must crack jokes. She told me last night, Dhamma talk too serious. I must add jokes in between. Why craving to end existence? Why? Now, the Buddha said that in us, or in even India 2,600 years ago, there are two main predominant views. One view is called eternalism, which means I came from Brahma, I will be here forever, I will merge with Brahma, and I will be there forever. The Buddha said that is wrong. Kamata just sit in meditation and look. You're not even the same for five seconds, let alone eternally. Okay? Within the five seconds also, you see the monkey jumping everywhere. But this is a common concept even today. That's why people will tell you, you don't believe in me, you will burn in hell forever. How can you burn in hell forever unless you cannot change, right? How can you live in heaven forever unless you cannot change? But the Buddha said that very thing is illogical because the Buddha said, if you cannot change, that means you are there right from the beginning to the end, then the spiritual life, the Buddha said, no need to live already. That means if you are bad, huh, you're forever going to be bad you know, because you are made that way. If you are good, then you forever be good. So the Buddha said, that's wrong. Then the other extreme end is, I'm born, I gamble, womanize, drink like a fish, do anything. Lah. Because of that, I'm going to die. And die, that's it. No more. Habis. Gone. Only out. The Buddha said, that is also wrong. So what did the Buddha teach? Very modern. 2,600 years ago, the Buddha taught that. Said the people who recorded it didn't have such modern words. Now what happened when I die? 
I will not exist as Puna Wong eternally. The Buddha already told you that is wrong. But neither will Puna Wong disappear tomorrow and be nothing unless something dramatic happened and he became an Arahan. So what will happen to Puna Wong? Puna Wong will be recycled. Every atom, every element in his body, all the energy in his body will be recycled. That's why you learn from physics, energy can never be created nor destroyed, only transformed. So Puna Wong will be recycled. Into what form? Well, that depends on what he's doing. If he's very bad, Kasat 2.6 trillion or whatever, lah, then he will be recycled into some not very nice thing. Lah. He's very good. Share 10 more times at Shah Alam, and then maybe he'll be recycled into something very nice and pleasant. But even that is, which he's recycled into is also impermanent. So that's why the Buddha said, Ini pun salah. So Karin, don't go and cheat, cheat, cheat multi million companies, write contracts favoring you, and after you become a billionaire, and then you say, After die, already nothing. Ah. You know, because this craving to end existence is also wrong. The Buddha said these two extreme views are both wrong. What is right, the Buddha said, is dependent origination. You will keep on being recycled based on causes, conditions, effects. You know the Nobel Prize this year, the one by the three physicists? They should have awarded the Nobel Prize to the Buddha because 2,600 years ago the Buddha said that. Now they gave the Nobel Prize to these three physicists. You know you have these pairs of electrons which can be paired. So you can have one electron here in Uncle Leong's place and the other electron there in where my wife is sitting. Completely separated by a million miles as far as an electron is concerned. You do something to this electron, that electron will change. Okay? You have this famous double slit experiment. Two slits you may have done in school. You create a wave which goes through the two slits. So based on whether there's an observer observing or not, what comes out of the other two sides is going to have a completely different result. So nobody is observing, it will have a certain pattern. Somebody stand there and look, the pattern changes. It's a very famous double slit experiment. It's dependent on origination. When this arises, that arises. When this ceases, that ceases. So they should have given the Nobel Prize to the Buddha. 2,600 years ago, he described this. So, Karin, both extremes, the Buddha said, is wrong. You will have dependent arising. You will be recycled based on dependent origination. So now, next. So, did the Buddha say this is wrong? Because a lot of Buddhist centers and people I am close with, they go share and they say, the Buddha taught this, life is suffering. You know, I am not joking. I was somewhere, I won't even mention where, and we had this venerable who let us walk around the stupa chanting, Dukkha, 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 Dukkha. I tell you, the Christians are waiting outside the door huh, to welcome everybody who comes up. So did the Buddha say life is suffering, which so many people go around teaching? The Buddha did not say life is suffering. The Buddha said life has dukkha. He did not say life has suffering. There are so many suttas in the Samyutta in which the Buddha said there is so much pleasure in life. And I just quote one for you here. This is taken from Samyutta Nikaya 22, 28. And the Buddha said, if there is no gratification in form, sentient beings wouldn't love it. Playboy magazine wouldn't be able to sell. But because there is gratification in form, Playboy, penthouse, what's that the classmates like to see? The Japanese manga, uh, manga, hentai. Okay? Students like it. I have some crazy over the Japanese manga. 
So there is gratification in form. That's why sentient beings love it. And the Buddha said this, until I have fully understood what is this gratification in form, I cannot even declare that I am awakened. I myself have to fully understand what is this gratification in form. But there is lots of gratification, the Buddha said. But if form had no drawback, then sentient beings won't go disillusioned. But form has drawback. Because form has anicca, dukkha, anatta. It has the three characteristics of impermanence, dukkha, untranslatable, and non-self, perishing. Sujato translated as perishing. So that nice Playboy magazine, you buy a magazine Playboy 30 years ago with Dolly Parton and you look at Dolly Parton now and you will know what I mean. It is a nature. So form has drawbacks. That's why people become disillusioned. This form has no drawbacks and no disillusion already. Okay, you don't need to change your car. Buy one car, you use eternally. Why do you need to change car? I had to change one of my cars, it's already what, 12 years old or something. And because I repaired this part, wow, very good. Then two months later, that part. Then okay, then I repair that part, oh, very good. Then two months later, that part. Then, okay, I might as well change the car. Huh? Cannot be endlessly every two months change one part. <laughs> so form has its drawback. I'm going to tickle Kareem. Sorry, I only know very few names. Huh? Kareem. The Chinese word for form, se. Se so xiang xing su, form, se. It's also the same word for color, sex. Okay? What is at the top of the word tamata? A knife, se. Yeah, see, tamata no Chinese, you bluff us, say you don't know Chinese. A Chinese word for se. Form, form, has a knife at the top. Be very careful. It can cut you. Okay, it's very nice, but it can cut you. Okay, so the Buddha said form has drawbacks. That's why. Now, if there is no escape from form, then sentient beings don't want to escape, but because there is an escape. And what is that escape? It's the Eightfold Path. All right? So if now... All the good people in here say, okay, woman Ming Pai Lao La, woman Ming Pai Lao, first noble truth, second, third, fourth. Now we know we have to let go of craving, uh, emotion. We know what is the important aspects we have to let go. And now I will live my life dedicated to that. You know what the rest of the world call you? They will call you crazy. Because you are going against the stream of almost everyone. Last night we had a nice dinner. Did we celebrate it with alcohol? We didn't. Okay? Now you attend any other function, say uska, wedding, ka, whatever. And let's say in that table there are people putting alcohol, people are yamsing, yamsing away, and then they come round and offer to you, and then your friend who knows you will say, Oh, mobe, mobe, he got hot fat, hot to sort of yam jaga. Isn't that a common remark? We get that all the time. Uh. All the time. Hey, don't say anything. This is a hot fat. It's already been taken. It's already been taken. It's more. Right, Uncle Leon? So forget about whether you want to buy Birkin bag or not. Lah. That one is even immaterial. Lah. But you are going to be different. Because you are going against the stream. Now, did the Buddha realize that? Yeah, of course the Buddha realized that. You know that after the Buddha was awakened, like most Buddhas who are awakened, they become Pacheka Buddhas. Most Buddhas who are awakened become Pacheka Buddhas, you know. The ones that teach are very few ones, you know. Because after they become awakened, after they can see reality, see the truth, and they look at this bunch and they say, <laughs> And this, our Sama Sambuddha, because He's Sama Sambuddha because he made that decision, he will teach. Initially, he was inclined to be a Pacheka Buddha. 
That means they will not teach. They will just let the life force pass away. But he looked at us and he said, okay, la, okay, la, teach, la, teach. La. So this is what he said. Samyutta Nikaya 6.1. See, Karim, why you must get a copy of Samyutta Nikaya? Okay. This principle I have discovered is deep, hard to see, hard to understand, but it's peaceful, but something sublime. It's beyond the scope of logic, which is why I'm going to try so long to explain. Subtle, comprehensible to the astute. But people like attachment. They love it and enjoy it. Everyone here likes attachment. You know, some years ago, I invited Ajahn Brahm to Johor Bahru. My wife was there. So he gave a usual talk, very inspiring as usual. And one lady, maybe that lady drinking water, put her hand up. You know, in Malaysia, people putting up their hands or ask questions is a rarity. Eh? Most time, any question? <laughs> so, no, there's this lady. Wow. So she stood up and she said, Ajahn, can I be enlightened in this life? Think for a moment how Ajahn Brahm replied. Of course, you know Ajahn Brahm, lah, huh? without even five seconds, he, pew, he immediately gave the reply. For me, I have to think 10, 20 minutes, then only can reply. Ajahn Brahm pew, immediately replied. Sister, Ajahn said, your question is wrong. It is not, as you ask, can I be enlightened in this life? The question is wrong. So your question will be, do I want to be enlightened in this life? And the reality, he said, every one of you in this room do not want to be enlightened in this life. Because you've got too much enjoyment. You've got too much attachments that you are not willing to let go of. So it's not, can I be enlightened in this life? It's, do I want to be enlightened in this life? And he said, almost all of you here do not want to be enlightened in this life because you've got too much attachments, too much enjoyment. Then he asked, sister, are you married? And she said, yes, I'm married. And he said, sister, if you tell me that I want to be enlightened in this life, and you go home now, it was a talk at night, and you find stuck on the door of your house a note by your husband, my dear wife, I have run away with the maid because I think I love her more than I love you. What will you do? The whole audience of women are cannot. How can you do such a thing? Almost a whole audience, all women all in unison said that. And Ajahn Brahm said, if you tell me that you want to be enlightened in this life, you will say, congratulations, my dear hubby. I'm so happy you found someone better than me. I wish you all the very best. Go with my full blessings. Get it, sister? We don't want to be enlightened in this life because we've got too much attachments. Maybe to the Nikon camera, maybe to the nice car, Honda, whatever. whatever. But we are attached. Consciously, unconsciously, we are attached. Understand? So the Buddha said, it is hard for them to see this thing that is dependent origination. Now we always talk about dependent origination. Dependent origination is very, very profound. Because dependent origination actually explains to us how come you see yourself as different from her, as different from him, and how come you create craving. I'll just give a small little illustration because low cost said too profound. Just small illustration. The stealing of activities, the letting go of attachments, the ending of craving. Okay. So this the Buddha fully realized is against the stream. Samyutta Nikaya 6.1. Now this in sharing, I was sharing with another brother in Stramban because he said he's scared. The more he studied, the more he becomes scared. He said that he's not sharing accurately what the Buddha taught. So I said, don't worry. Next time, every time you share, give a sutta reference. Whatever you say, back it up with a sutta so that people can actually look it up themselves. 
if they say hi my god okay lot even look after yourself lah so that's a better way nowadays it's just like when we present in medicine ah honey everything now you say you must put the paper to back it up you know you cannot just say ah oh, i think ah it should be like that who cares what you think nobody care what you think you have to back it up with a medical paper preferably random control okay not observational so 6.1 it says i struggle hard to realize this enough with trying to explain it this principle is not easily understood by those mired in greed and hate which is most of us those besotted by greed can't see what's subtle going against the stream deep hard to see and very fine because they are shrouded in a mass of darkness you are swimming against the stream because the mass of humanity has one religion called consumerism that's the main religion consumerism greed even the other religions wanting to go heaven is greed you know is craving you know the buddha said all right now now i want to introduce a very important point eh? so then i don't want you all to go back depressed you know or you all this tuna fellow eh? tell me give up everything don't want to go to heaven don't want my birkin bag like that say you know one devotee on the following my sharing regularly online say dr wong uh, i do all this i become a stone already you know, you know, like a stone like that. so i say no 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 you become a stone because you don't understand the buddhist teaching nibbana is not the end of everything if you look at the canon the buddha always described nibbana as the deathless state it is always described as the deathless state Now let's bring back to dependent origination because the Buddha's main quest was answering dependent origination. When he was a bodhisattva, what was the main question that troubled him? Aging, sickness, and death. How do I end aging, sickness, and death? And let's be honest: any one of us who live old enough, who gone through a lot of problems, will know aging, sickness, and death is very painful. You lose loved ones. The Buddha said, "How can you not lose loved ones when all of us are perishable? No body can escape that." Okay, King Pasenadi lost his grandmother. King Pasenadi was very close to his grandmother. When King Pasenadi went to see the Buddha and informed the Buddha that my grandmother, my beloved grandmother, has died. And King Pasenadi told the Buddha, "I will be willing to give up my entire kingdom, all my wealth, all my power, all my riches, just to have my grandmother back, because she loved me and I loved her so much." And the Buddha had to explain, "Have I not taught you? All of us are anicca dukkha anatta. How can we not be separated?" When you got two impermanent things coming together, we will be separated. So the Buddha's question is: How can I end this horrible pain of aging, sickness, and death, of separation, etc.? That's the twelfth link to independent origination. So what was the answer? If you do not want to have aging, sickness, death, the long list which I will mention, I already said it right at the very beginning. Then you must go to the eleventh link and stop that eleventh link. What's the eleventh link? Birth. As long as you are born, you are going to have aging, sickness, and death. You're going to have all the rest. As long as you are born. So the next question the Buddha then asks: How can you not be born? Then you go back one link before that. So before jati lah, then you have. Power, power, continuing existence. What's before that? Upadana. What's before that? Craving. What's before that? Feeling. So the Buddha has found a fundamental thing. As long as you're born, you're going to have aging, sickness, without fail. So the only way you can be freed from aging, sickness, and death is to be liberated. That means you mustn't go through the process of cyclic existence or being recycled. 
Now, if you look at the candle, see the candle there? In those days, the Buddha used candles to illustrate because, well, there's no electric light. So they use fruits, they use candles and all that to illustrate. You see the candle there? The candle is burning. That candle is burning because there's fuel. There's fire. There's oxygen. So if you let the candle keep on burning, you will reach a point where the fuel will run out. And then the candle will stop. And the Buddha asked, where has the candle gone to? To us, we say, no more. Now some of you here are science studies, science students. Has that candle disappeared? No, that candle has merely been manifested in other ways. Heat, light, energy. That's why I was trying to teach you. The candle has not died. In the Indian mind of 2,600 years ago, a flame that goes out when the fuel is extinguished is liberated. It is freed. That's why you read the suttas, you will always see this reference. In fact, the word Nibbana means the end of the flame burning. Alright? So, the Buddha always described Nibbana as the deathless state. Because now you are no longer born, aged, sick and done. You are free. And the next word is liberation. So from Samyutta Nikaya again I quote, Flung open are the doors to deathlessness. Let those with ears commit to faith. And this is very, very important for every one of you who are now undergoing stress. And I'm sure every one of you have subtle forms of stress. The only person I know who has no stress is the cops lying in the coffin. <laughs> Besides that, everybody got stress. My apologies to the Arahan in this hall, but beyond that, everybody has stress. This is what the Buddha said when he sent the first batch of Arahans out to share. I am freed from all snares. Sujato translated it as snares. Some translate as fetters, some translate as chains. But he said, I am freed from all fetters, all chains, both human and divine. You, those who are awakened among them, are also freed from all these snares, both human and divine. I think it's very important. What does this mean when I tell Kareen that you will be freed from all snares, human and divine? Let's start with the human ones. There are a lot of things that she knows, which are human stairs, without again mentioning centers or temples or places all over the world. There are many centers which say, Kareen, you cannot wipe the Buddha image, huh? you cannot wash. Huh? Why? Because you're a woman. Right? I'm not joking. It is, I have no idea where those giants who think of such things came out with such ridiculous ideas. I hope Shah Alam doesn't practice that. Don't get me kicked out. But there are places that say, Kareem, you cannot, because you're a woman. That is a human factor. India, lucky worse. This caste, that caste, that caste, that caste. This one cannot do this, that one cannot do that. Lucky worse. Okay? We also got so much. Think about it. What about divine factors? We also got a lot of divine factors, you know. Okay. Dictated by humans la. in the name of God. La. I cannot say la, I don't want to be arrested. La. But we also got plenty of divine factors in Malaysia. Okay? Dictated by human in the name of God. Okay? A lot of it. You just think about what I mean, la. I don't want to say it. Auntie Kamata got to bail me out from jail. <laughs> but we have got lots of divine factors as well. But the Buddha said, once you understand the Dhamma, you're freed from all these. So Kamata, when you finish wiping this, uh, you can come to my house and wipe mine at home also. You know, you're welcome, you know, it's alright. No issue at all. Wonder thought for the welfare and happiness of the people out of compassion for the good benefit, welfare, happiness of gods and humans. And then he said, teach the Dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, meaningful and well-praised. Reveal a spiritual practice that's entirely pure, full and pure. 
There are beings with little dust in their eyes. Look at this blind. You are the ones here with little dust in your eyes. You are so lucky. They are in decline because they haven't heard the teaching. There will be those who understand. But I hope you understand. So, Samyutta Nikaya 5195. Do you know that you are very, very rare? You are like a diamond. Five carat with all the five C's. Clarity, etc., etc. This, the Buddha say, is very rare. Very, very rare. A realized one, perfected one, a fully awakened one. Now, we always talk about Buddhas and Buddhas and Buddhas and Buddhas and Buddhas. You've got a thousand Buddha hall or whatever. How many Buddhas are mentioned in the Nikayas? Can you tell me? Kamata? This whole Nikaya. The Buddha looked back, 91 yawns. 91 yawns uh, when he became awakened. One yawn is Big Bang, then Big Collapse. Don't worry, the world is only about 13 billion years old. We've still got a long way more. One cycle is estimated to be about 30 billion years. Big Bang, then Big Collapse. About 30 billion, estimated of course. We are only about, we are a very young universe. We're only about 12, 13 billion years old right now. That's why our universe is still expanding. It will expand, expand, expand till one time when the expansion contraction forces equal and then it will contract and collapse and then the Big Bang will repeat called the Big Bounce. Alright? The Buddha on his awakening looked back 91 yawns, 91 Big Bangs. You know how many Buddhas he saw in that 91 Big Bangs? Six Buddhas. He is the seventh Buddha in 91. Before that, don't know. He could only see back up to 91. Of course, there's some more behind. But in here, you will find the names of the six Buddhas that he could see as he looked back in 91 years. So a Buddha is very, very rare. A fully awakened Buddha who teaches. But this is important. This two that I put in red in the sky. Because you are, you are the one sitting here in front of me now. You are very rare. How many people are there in the Klang Valley? Three million. How many people in this room? Include the ones online. You know, I think it's not even 0.01%. So you are very rare. And the ones who are grateful, that's why I started with Katanu. First teaching of the Buddha. Very, very rare. This is from Anguttara Nikaya 3.61, and this is important because while we are familiar with the Four Noble Truths, like what I showed you earlier, in here the Four Noble Truths is linked to dependent origination. So the second Noble Truth is dependent origination forward, ignorance giving rise to choices, choices giving rise to consciousness, all the way to old age, death, sorrow, lamentation. And this became, in here, the second noble truth, the cause of the suffering. So the cause of the suffering starts because you are ignorant, and because you are ignorant, you make not so very wholesome choices, and that give rise to the whole chain, all the way until this. Now you are less ignorant, so your choices are better. Surely you are not going to pay 100,000 to buy a bag. She's in there. Right? Even if your husband got 10 million in the bank, Kamata, you don't need 100,000 back. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh. Okay, uh, maybe he got 100, one, 10 million in the bank, uh, 1,000 dollars back is good enough. Uh, okay? And the third noble truth became dependent origination, the good part. And England fades away, what happens? And then, of course, in the end, when rebirth will cease, old age, all these will cease. So I'm trying, I showed this because this is very important. Because we are familiar with the earlier version, but a lot of us are not familiar with this, whereby dependent origination is mixed together with this, to, to illustrate to you. So again, all of us are familiar with the Eightfold Path, right? 
how many of you are aware that it's actually not an eightfold path? It's actually a tenfold path. If you go to Anguttara Nikaya Book of Tens, you find a whole series there on tenfold path. So why is it that we seldom talk about the ninth and the tenth factor? Because the ninth and the tenth factor is the result of the first eight factors. And in Samyutta Nikaya, of course, it's also there. Sentient beings, we will look at the second one first, will come together. So sentient beings come together and converge because of an element, those of wrong will with those of wrong will. You are here today because you are those who come together because of right will. Okay? So same thing. Wrong will come together and then they will have wrong thoughts. So they go gambling, womanizing, etc., etc., etc. And as a result, they have wrong knowledge, mitcha, yana, and wrong freedom, mitcha, vimoti. They have knowledge. You look at those fellows gambling on all the mahjong fellows. Well, they're damn smart, but it's wrong knowledge. It's mitcha, yana. And they think they are liberated, but the Buddha says, Micha Vimoti, wrong liberation. While well, you get together, you develop right will, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right stillness, and you have Samayana, Sama Vimoti. You develop right insight and right liberation. You are freed. Zi So it's next important thing is how do you walk then? After that, some of you will say, well, very easy. Some will say very difficult. Some will say, okay, lah. But the important thing is how do you do it? The Buddha said, is you must have spiritual friends. Without spiritual friends, it's very difficult. Because spiritual friends will encourage you, keep you together, help you walk the Noble Eightfold Path, culminating in right knowledge and right liberation. That's why you need this group. That's why yesterday night when Sunanda took me for the dinner, I said, he introduced to me past, present, future people running this. Okay, so I was very happy because I could see Sister Karin and she's younger than me. Because in almost all the Buddhist centers in Malaysia, when they introduce the ex school or the people in charge, they're older than me. <laughs> and I already way, 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 way long time ago, eligible to pick out all my EPF, so you know how old I am. And yet the ex-coder is older than me, which makes me worried, because you need young people, okay, to bring in new ideas, fresh air, etc. So you are familiar with this, where the Buddha said, Kayana meters, they will be the ones who will help you develop and cultivate this. So when you have good friends, companions and associates, you will live supported by one thing, religion. Without this, you are not going to be diligent because you need this to motivate each other. So what is Nibbana? Samyutta Nikaya 38 one. Sariputta was asked, they speak of this one thing called Nibbana. Sariputta replied, it's the ending of greed, hate, and delusion. You're all familiar with this, right? I don't have to explain this. You're all familiar. Nibbana is the end of great hatred and delusion. You know, the Chinese word for delusion is ci, you know, qi xin, but qi, you know. Literally, from the Buddha's viewpoint, uh, you are like qi xin men, you know, running around, up and down the side of the river. That's exactly how the Buddha described our life, you know. We, he said we are all like people, one river, and then we are on one side, and we are all doing this. Every day, running up and down. Don't know for what, but we are all running up and down. Think about it. Isn't that true? Think about it. Go to school, study hard, get a career, earn money. Then after that, ha, 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 he, he, he. I'm told there are wow parties in Kota Kamuning yesterday. <laughs> Ha ha ha, he, 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 hoo, hoo, hoo. then after the forsake die, then come back again, then repeat the same thing. So we're all on the side of the river, the Buddha say, running up and down, running up and down, and going nowhere. So he said, it's the ending of greed, hatred, and delusion. And the person asked, is there a path and practice for this? And he said, yeah, 
simply this, the Noble Eightfold Path, and you will attain the end of greed, hatred, and delusion. And then I said, say it, somebody online wrote and said, Dr. Wong, I do this, and then I become like a stone. Eh? No, you won't become a stone. You won't. I guarantee you, you won't. Because when you finally understand what is a nature, Karin, very easy to look at what is a nature. Look at your passport photo when you are 5 years old, then 12 years old, then 21 years old, and now. Put all the four passport photos together and you will know what is a nature. Alright. Dukkha, you know by now, you are already working. Okay. Anatta, you will learn as the Dhamma goes in the Dhamma stream and you will fully realize what is one self. So what is the end of this great hatred and delusion? What's the mind state? Is it a stone? No, you will not be a stone. Because when you finally understand anatta, non-self, when you break through this barrier of that's kamata, that's me, and there's nothing to do between the two of us. And that's because we create that mindset because of papancha, because of feelings, because of mental proliferation. When you truly understand anatta, you will see us all related, interrelated. And the Buddha said, when you truly understand these three universal characteristics, you will know what is dependent on origination, why we are all actually just united, then you will really have what is called metta. I hope you understand that whatever metta you are practicing is what is called an imperfect metta. Because that metta that you are practicing rests on the foundation of me. You ask people to do good. Only just yesterday morning we were at a, another center chit-chatting. This was also said. You ask people to do good. Do good. Set up dialysis. Contribute. The first thing in people's mind is, oh, your are so associated. Right, Kamata? No, Kamata has gone beyond that. Kamata is on the way. But most people, they say, Kamata is on the way. Kamata is on the way. Right? Let's be frank. So our metta, the Buddha said, must be developed such that you are like my child, you are like my father, you are like my uncle. Not, I do it because I get something out of it. Same with Karuna, Mudita, rejoicing. Wow, Kamata Fatalo, he say Mudita. Because she's taking me out to eat, ma. Let's say she doesn't take me out to eat, will I also say mudita? But if you truly understand Anicca Dukkha Anatta, yeah, we rejoice for you. We share your happiness. And the even more difficult one is Upeka, equanimity. You truly have to understand Anicca Dukkha Anatta before you can really say, I am equanimous. You know that in Chinese, if you say you are equanimous, huh? That is also saying that I am enlightened. Huh? Okay, the Chinese equivalent is Ba Fong Ba Tong. The eight winds, remember? Gain and loss, fame and blame, praise and censure, pleasure and pain. These are the eight winds. Because these affect every one of us, the Buddha said. So we want the gain, we don't want the loss. Okay? You want the praise, you don't want the censure, etc. But if you are awakened, all these eight have no difference to you. Okay? Because now you see the big picture. So the story is, if I say, oh, it means I am awakened. My mind is It is so still that either side doesn't affect me. So you all know the story of Su Tong Po, right? Very famous poet. One of his poems even became a very popular Chinese song. Okay, maybe Honey can sing for us afterwards. <laughs> but he's a very famous poet. And he studied Chan with a very famous Chan master. I'm sure some of you have heard the story. Okay? So one fine day, Su Tung Po was meditating across Sai Wu. La. They are in Hangzhou. Ma. So he was across Sai Wu there meditating. And he said, I am enlightened. Call his servant. Give me Man Fong Sei Bo. 
So he quickly wrote a poem, which basically translates, Ngopat Fung Choi Bat Dong. Eight winds cannot move me, cannot blow me. Roll it up, tell the servant. Quickly roll across Sai Wu, pass it to that monk. Give it to the monk, monk open. Bat Fung Choi Bat Dong. Which means enlightened all. The monk said, give me the pen. He wrote at the bottom, just two Chinese characters. To go back. Then he gave it to the boy, please send it back to Su Dong Po. So the poor boy will roll across and give it to Su Dong Po. Su Dong Po opened. He looked at the two words, he was furious. Absolutely livid. Told the boy, you fetch me immediately to see that stupid old monk. So the poor boy again, <laughs> across Sai Wu. Went up and asked the old monk, I wrote to you, no bad feng choi bad dong. Oh, I mean, I enlightened. How can you be such a rude, horrible old monk? What did you write there? Fong pei. Fang pi. He found out two words, fang pi. Then the monk said, You told me, bad feng choi bad dong. Mo ya ko pei ya. Blow you across the sai wu. Where is your stillness? Where is your chen ting? Nothing. Get it? Clear, Karim? So, the mind state of the awakened being is the mind of generosity. Because now he doesn't see a separation between you and me. It is the mind of genuine equanimity, Upeka and Mudita. Now he can truly celebrate whatever achievement you have. Because he doesn't see it as lege and orge. The mind state of anger and hatred has ended. His mind state is the mind of metta karuna, loving kindness and compassion. And of course the end of the illusion, insight and wisdom. So don't worry, you will not become a stone. You will in fact become a very kind, very wise, very active person. Okay? So strictly speaking, there are no enlightened people because he's in Wu Wo. They only enlightened activity. So the Nirvana chapter is a very interesting chapter. As I told you, the Agamas, all the four Nikayas have the equivalents in the Agamas. Now the Dhammapada also has an equivalent in the Chinese translation. So you've got the Pali Dhammapada, which you're all familiar with. And you've got a Chinese Dhammapada. I hope there's one downstairs in the library. Now the Chinese Dhammapada has more chapters than the Pali Dhammapada. And one of the chapters missing in the Pali Dhammapada is the Nirvana chapter or Nirvana chapter. You know the Dhammapada is all pairs of verses. And these verses are taken from the Nikayas. You can actually find back the original source. The Nirvana chapter also are pairs of verses, exactly like the rest. And those verses are also found in the Nikayas. They are just taken out and put there. Alright? So for a long, long time, we had no access to the Chinese Dhammapada Nirvana chapter. In one of the last books written by Thich Nhat Hanh before he became ill and sick, he wrote a commentary on the Nirvana chapter of the Chinese Dhammapada. So he has the Chinese words and, of course, his translation and his commentary. Now, unfortunately, the Chinese Dhammapada, like the Agamas, are written in classical Chinese. So I showed it to my friends who are Chinese educated up to university level. And I asked them, can you explain these lines for me? And they can't. They can read every character, but they say, I cannot understand what it says. Because it's not Putonghua, it's Wen Yan Wen. But thanks to Thich Nhat Hanh, great scholar, great Chinese scholar. He's Vietnamese, but great Chinese scholar. He wrote a commentary. So, you can easily buy that book online. Huh? And in that book, which I've made an extract here, the great venerable, who has passed away, you know. Huh? He said, many people think that Nirvana is a place of happiness. I already told you it's not a place. Okay? Where people who are enlightened go when they die. 
I already told you, bukan macam ini. The instant you have the end of great hatred in your ranks, the instant you understand, you already in Nibbana. This is a mind state. No idea can be more misleading. Okay? So don't think that what the Buddha teach is after life. No, the Buddha teaches everything for this life. That's why Venerable, the late Venerable Punaji used right view, right thoughts as harmonious view, harmonious thought. Because he wants to emphasize this life. We are not talking about an afterlife thing. Okay? The Buddha taught many times that is realized right here and now, and it means liberation, zizai, freedom, zizai. If you are able to free yourself from your afflictions such as attachment, hatred, jealousy, then you can free yourself from wrong views which I already told you, like all these ideas, and then you are in touch with Nirvana right now. Get it? And this is the book which you can buy online, which I highly recommend. I'm going to end by reading you this. The aim of almost all of us here is to be a Sotapan. First level of awakening. Sotapan. A hundred years ago, Sotapan was translated as tree mentor. We are all stuck. Cannot change. Because it's in common consciousness. What does the word sota mean? The word sota means year. The linger. Nini. That's what it means. So sota pan, sota apana, actually can also be translated as year entra. Because why Brother Tan listens to the Dhamma? When Brother Tan hear this from me, Brother Tan will suddenly realize, hey, that is why so many people in the canon, when they listen to the Dhamma, become Sotapans. Because they understood. I'll give you an example. Anna Kondana, all of you are familiar. First sermon, the first five ascetic. Who was the one who understood? Anna Kondana. What was he doing? Listening to the Buddha. And he became a Sotapan. So here I want to read from Samyutta Nikaya 55.5. Eh? And this is on what is the factors of stream entry. How all of you here can go on to be a year enterer. What is the factor of year entry? The factors of year entry are association with good people. And that's very important. That's the very first thing in the Mangala Sutta. You associate with the wrong people, habis already. Okay? You associate with gamblers, womanizers, habis. You associate with people who only shop. Birkin bag and Hermes bag and nothing else, habis. So you must associate with good people. So please continue associating with these good people. Listening to the true teaching. Just listen. Proper attention. Don't think of other things when you're here. Lah, okay? And practicing in line with the teaching. That's all. Just these four things. I repeat. Associating with good people. Listening to the true teaching, proper attention, and practicing in line with the teaching. These four things. Factors for stream entry. Okay, next one. Okay. For Brother Tan, how listening can make you awaken? And the Buddha said, sometimes a bhikkhu pays heed, pays attention, engages wholeheartedly and lends a year to the teaching. Doesn't talk about stream. Eh? My Singapore friends say if stream enter, they've got no hope. Eh? Because there are no streams in Singapore. But long kang on it, they say. So my Singapore friends say if stream enter means we have the muscle long kang already. Okay, there are no streams in Singapore. So I say, don't worry. Year enter. Lends a year to the teaching. At such time, the five hindrances are absent. Now, when you are here listening, did you have any sensual desires? Look at this old man, la, mana, the sensual desire. If anything, I led you to the opposite direction. La. Okay? Was there anger and ill will? Was there sloth and torpor? 
Was there doubt? Was there restlessness? God, lah, I saw Brother Yo. <laughs> <laughs> but never mind, never mind. It basically is telling you that when you are listening, sota, paying attention, the five hindrances disappear. You know, this is very important in Buddhism. You know, all of you are familiar. When the five hindrances disappear, that's where you enter the first jhana. The first jhana is entered when your five hindrances disappear. Not because you say, I want the jhana, I want first jhana. No, when your five hindrances disappear, you automatically will enter the first. And the seven awakening factors can develop to perfection. So just by listening. So please... For those of you who are organizing all these talks, I thank you. I'm very grateful to you. You continue doing this, and I'm very sure among this group, among you all who are continuing, there will be Sotapanna. There will be year entrer, people who enter because they listen. Now, I bought presents for everyone who came here as a reward. It's with Sister Karine. Uh, Brother Leong said, don't give until you talk over uh, so that you cannot escape, <laughs> catch them here. Okay, but I've brought presents for all of you. These are books that, two of which I wrote, the third one we published for free distribution. Not free distribution. Ajahn Brahm always say free distribution is the wrong word. Priceless distribution. With that, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to do some wholesome work. Thank you to the Shah Alam committee for inviting me. Katanu, gratitude. Sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Punya Wong, for this very enlightening talk. I trust a lot of us have been enlightened today. For unenlightened people, if there are any questions, you can uh, raise up with Dr. Punya. Uh, by the way, we have about 100 audiences online today. And uh, there will also be questions online, so we are open for questions from both our physical audience as well as our online questions. I think someone can pass any line to anybody who likes to ask questions. Okay, um, I'll start off with some online questions. <coughs> Dr. Punya, I got uh, someone, L.Y. Teo, uh, I'm not sure it's a lady or a guy. The question is a bit long, so I'll read it out slowly. Uh, most Theravada monks have the opinion that Buddha's teachings are contained in Tipitaka. Teachings are not listed in the Adama and are dangerous. They can lead to the demise of Buddhism. Some even said that the Hat Sutta, despite its profound teaching, is Adama because it belittles venerable Sariputta. It makes him look stupid even though in the tipa, Tipitaka. Venerable Sariputta is the most intelligent disciple of the Buddha. Also, Avalokiteswara is a fictitious figure not listed in the Tipitaka. How should I learn Buddhism, stick to the Tipitaka, or choose what I think makes sense? A very good question. Huh? The Heart Sutra is first and foremost not a sutra. Many people are not aware of that. The first time the word Heart Sutra is used is after Xuan Chang edited what was the Pore Polomi Dharani. And it is a mnemonic device to assist memory. Alright? When Xuan Chang edited it, changing the top and the bottom, using the middle part, he gave it the name Xing Jing. But the word Jing in Chinese does not have the same implication as the word Sutta in Pali. Jing in Chinese is any classical work, including San Zi Jing, etc. Any classical work. We interpret Sutta is either the words of the Buddha or the words of Sariputta or Ananda. And so we tend to confuse the two. The second thing you have to realize is the word um, Avalokiteshvara. 
It's very, very interesting because if you study the Heart Sutra, you will find that the Heart Sutra is like a road map which brings you from this state to an awakened state. And the Heart Sutra describes the mind of an awakened being, how he perceives the world. It is like me now writing for you a summary of today's teachings, just like that. But because the Heart Sutra is so well written that in just 260 words, it manages to summarize almost the entire Samyutta Nikaya, that it has become beloved of people who are trying to understand and trying to let go. Let's take a look at the word Avalokiteshvara. I think that the first thing people must do is not be critical, but learn. I've spent 30 years of my life studying the Heart Sutra and there's still so much to learn. Before Xuan Zhang, the Heart Sutra Dharani, Porepolomni Dharani, was already in existence. It was believed to be translated by Kumarajiva, the one who translated the Diamond Sutra. And Kumarajiva is up there, huge big translator with a stature so high that it's almost untouchable because he translated the Diamond Sutra. All right, Xuanzang lived 200 years after Kumarajiva. And for a small un to come out and say, what you translated is wrong, is literally shaking the very foundation because Kumarajiva translated the first three words as Huan Shi Yin which Xuanzang said is wrong. Xuanzang translated or edited, that's why the Heart Sutra is not listed as one of the works of translation by Xuanzang. He did hundreds of translations, his disciples collated all of them, but Heart Sutra is not in that list because they all knew he merely edited it. He, trans, he edited the front and the back. And because it is so long in his explanation, I will only attempt to explain the first line. Because if you can understand just the first line, I congratulate you. So Quan Zhang changed Guan Si Yin, which he says is wrong as a translation, to Guan Zi Zai. So if I were to ask sister, now you have studied this path very well, and I'm going to start, let's practice seriously. Let's all become awakened. Let's all become awakened to the truths of life. How do you start? Guan Zi Zai. What is Guan? To observe, to contemplate, to reflect. Guan Samele. Guan, you must Guan something. Anapanasati, Guan breath. Okay? Guan Samele. Guan Zi Zi Zi. When? Yesterday? Tomorrow? What am I going to do tomorrow? What I did yesterday? No. Time. Same time. So if Brother Tan says, I want to start on this path, I'm very serious. Then I will tell Brother, okay, let's start with Samatha Vipassana. One, Zhiji, same time. Alright. Pusa means Bodhisattva, the person seeking enlightenment. Bodhi, Pu, Sa, Sata. You must Xing Sun. You must walk profoundly. You cannot be half pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's no such thing as half pregnant. So if you are serious, you must sing shen. Shen ru de. Sing shen. For what? Sing shen to where? The next two words cannot be translated to Chinese. So Xuan Chang says, any words which cannot be translated, leave it. So he left it as it is. Prashna is wisdom. Paramita is perfect wisdom. Xing Shen Ore Polomitong. Perfect wisdom. That means you want to go for perfect wisdom. You will see as Brother Tan look inside. Zhao Jian. Look inside. Zhao Jian. Zhao Jian Sama. Wu Yin Jie Kong. What is Wu Yin? Your five. Khandas, what we talked about at length. You will see 
that your five khandas are empty. What is empty? Empty is anicca, dukkha, anatta. It is empty of any independent existence. It is always dependently arising. If you can see wu yin jie kong, you du yi qie wu er. That is the whole basis of a whole section on Nidana Samyutta, Khanda Samyutta, trying to see the five Khandas as not self, as impermanent, as Dukkha. So, I am not debating whether this is Theravada, Mahayana, whatever Yana. If you are to ask me, sister, what Yana is, Dr. Wong, I'll tell you I'm Hahayana. <laughs> okay? Because the pursuit of the Buddha Dharma is for happiness, for liberation. So, we are not here to talk whether Buddha said that word, because it is very clear right from the start that the Buddha is not even involved in the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra has no Buddha. The Heart Sutra is a mnemonic. It's a mnemonic device to put all the teachings of the Five Kanda, the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, etc etc all in 260 words so that you can remember it so that at any one moment you can have an insight because you see something and you link it clear i hope that explains it yeah thank you dr punya wong so we have another session of the heart sutra <laughs> learning today okay do you have any questions uh, from the audience here if not, I'll read the second question online. Okay, uh, this question is from his name. You just put his his or her name as Dukkha Cause. If Nibbana is deathless state, would it be more suffering since it couldn't die? Okay, that question is asked because the person is attached to form. You know that there's this wanderer called Vachagota. But Chakrata keep on irritating the Buddha. La. Endlessly you will find suttas there in which he will ask the Buddha this, ask the Buddha that, ask the Buddha this, ask the Buddha that. And sometimes the Buddha will answer him, sometimes the Buddha will not answer him. And one of the very common questions that is being asked, okay, by not just Vachagota but by other sects as well, is does the Buddha exist after Nibbana? Does the Buddha not exist after Nibbana? Does the Buddha both exist and not exist after Nibbana? Does the Buddha neither exist nor not exist after Nibbana? Right. I'm sure you're familiar. In the Pali Canon, 10 questions. In the Mahayana Canon, 14 questions. The Mahayana one got four more questions. The Pali one got 10. Okay. And these 10 questions, the Buddha would only explain privately because Sometimes, if you explain in public, you offend people. Just to give an example, and this is Yin Ling wrote to me, when Yin Ling is very well practiced now. Okay? Yin Ling said, one of the people asked, does the self exist? Or put it this way, is the self eternal? And the Buddha refused to answer. And then after that, the person left. And then Ananda asked, ah, how come he didn't answer? Putting into modern 21st language, 21st century language, paraphrasing. If he is to answer, he will be to say, your question is wrong. You're an idiot. The self does not even exist in the first place. So how can you ask whether the self is eternal or not eternal? The fact that that question is asked means you do not even understand the things before that. So, when you say rebirth, that will always refer to what I call linear view. I'm born, I die. I'm born, I die. I'm born, I die. But if you are an awakened being who sees the big picture, all right? understand this recycling. You understand who sen who mean, who ko who jing, 
Who zheng who jian. I hear people murmuring. Who who murmuring that? Hamata. Oh, honey. Yeah, well trained honey. I love honey. She's well trained. Where is that line found? Heart Sutra. When you understand the truth, when you understand truly what is emptiness, you will realize who sen who mian, who ko who jing, who zheng who jian. In the 20th century, who taught that? Albert Einstein. Who sen who mian, who ko who jing, who zheng who jian. But the thing is that you're still tied to samsara. And as long as you're tied to samsara, you will have this aging, sickness and death. Remember the Buddha's aim was to end aging, sickness and death. His aim is liberation. Zi zai. The zi zai and that deathless state cannot be described in our language because it is asking you to describe a color you have never seen. That's why the Buddha said, the state after enlightenment is unfathomable, like an ocean. You cannot describe it in human words because we have no idea how to describe it. But that deathless state, when people ask, does the Buddha exist after death? Does the Buddha not exist after death? Etc. The Buddha said, you are asking that question because you are still grasping onto form. That's why whenever the Buddha explained to his disciples, he will ask the disciples, do you see me in form? Do you see me in feeling? Do you see me in volition? Do you see me in conduct, etc. And the answer is always no, no, no. And the Buddha will say, if even now when I am alive and talking to you, then you do not see me in form, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. Much more after I passed away. So, again, I am not saying this because I say it, it's actually in the canon. The Buddha said the only reason people ask this question is because they are still attached to form. They are still attached to the concept of birth and death. They are still attached to the linear view that I am born here, I die here, that I am reborn here, I die there. Remember, the instant you become awakened, you are liberated from this. No more birth. Aging, sickness, death. Clear? All right. All right. Good. All right. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Doctor Punao. Okay. On behalf of uh, Shalom Buddhist Society, okay, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Kevin, to, uh, Brother Sunanda to give a token of appreciation to Doctor Punao. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay, we'll continue with the last part is the sharing of merits. <clears throat> Today, we have gathered in this hall to listen, discuss, and contemplate on the Dharma. In the process, we have created much meritorious actions. Let us therefore share this merit with all sentient beings for their happiness and well-being. Okay. Sharing of merits. Etavata cha amhehi sambatam punya sampadam sabe sata numodantu sapa sampati siddhiya Idam me nyati nam ho tu sukita hun tu nyatayo. Idam me nyati nam ho tu sukita hun tu nyatayo. Idam me nyati nam ho tu sukita hun tu nyatayo. I would like to share this marriage that I have gathered today as well as in the past with the devas may they rejoice in this marriage and bring blessings and protection to the world i dedicate this positive marriage to the elevation of suffering of all beings in woeful states i would also like to recall to mind my departed friends and relatives 
Wherever they are, may they be free from suffering and be happy. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be, and the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share in these merits which I have thus acquired through positive thoughts, words, and actions. May all beings use this merit for their good health, happiness, and peace. May all beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share in these merits of mine. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation for the benefit of all sentient beings. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. In concluding today's session, let us kneel and reaffirm our faith and refuge in the Triple Gems. I bow before the compassionate Buddha, the supremely enlightened one who shows the way to liberation. I bow before the glorious Dharma, the Buddha's teaching that leads from darkness to spiritual light. I bow before the Holy Sangha, the fellowship of Buddha's disciples, the inspires and guides. Okay, thank you again for today's session, attending for today's session, the announcement. The next Dharma talk will be on 11th of December, and uh, whether it's online or physical, we'll keep yourself, we'll be updated. Keep uh, just keep our lookout in our Facebook. The speaker is Professor Alvin Ng Lai Un, and the title is "Signs of Friendships in Mental Well-Being." Okay, okay. Thank you very much. There'll be refreshments downstairs in um, our dining, so we continue downstairs to have our fellowship. Thank you very much. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Illusion, ignorance.
Oh